Hello and good evening. Welcome to the C.S. Lewis Foundation's webinar series. We're delighted to welcome you today for our conversation with speaker Dr. Mark Knoll on his recent book, C.S. Lewis in America, Readings and Reception from 1935 to 1947, based on his lectures over the last few years at the Wade Center at Wheaton College. We'd like to thank our donors who make today's webinar and all the virtual and in-person gatherings possible. Thank you also to Matthew Clark and the Sweet Airs, who wrote and performed Pilgrims on the Way, the song playing as you joined today. I'm Amber Saladin, the Arts and Ministry Director for the C.S. Lewis Foundation. This might be your first time joining us. You're very welcome. Feel free to say hello in the chat and to tell us from where in the world you're joining us today. Allow me a moment to introduce you to the C.S. Lewis Foundation. Inspired by the life and legacy of C.S. Lewis, we encourage and equip Christians to live out our faith within the world of ideas and the arts. The goal is for our programs to produce spiritually equipped and culturally literate Christians who are transformative in whatever area they may be called to serve. We meet in person in multiple locations around the US and the UK, including Lewis's home in Oxford, the Kilns, which we own and operate. Our webinar series partners with our in-person events to provide community and engaging lifelong learning year round. <laughs> if you'd like to stay on after the webinar to have a discussion group with other folks, um, pay attention to the information coming up later. These discussion groups have provided a much needed way to process and think through some of the things that we learn in the webinars, much like the coffee break does when we're together in person. If you'd like to go back and watch some of our previous material, you can access that on our YouTube channel, as well as some of our in person lectures from previous conferences. And later, President Stephen Elmore will tell us more about the in person gatherings that we're planning now. So here's how this evening will work. Dr. Knoll will present his thoughts for about 20 minutes, and while he's speaking, you may use the Q&A button on the bottom to ask your questions at any time. You'll also notice the other button at the bottom, the chat button. I guess there's lots of buttons. <laughs> Feel free to use the chat button as you would during a live lecture, like when you would jut your friend with your elbow and say, that was great. And we'll also put links to any resources that might come up in the evening in that space as well. So keep your comments to the chat section and your questions for Dr. Knoll in the Q&A section, and that will help us keep everything separated during our time together. When Dr. Knoll is finished, we'll welcome the C.S. Lewis Foundation's academic director, Dr. Christopher Howell, on to ask a few of his own questions and to guide our conversation, and he will mix your questions in with tonight's discussion. At the C.S. Lewis Foundation, we're committed to engaging the soul as well as the mind. We believe that art has a wonderful way of sneaking past even our own watchful dragons in our own hearts and minds. We usually sing a hymn or read a poem or consider a classic work of art. But tonight, we wanted to do something a little different. For those of you who haven't heard, our founding president, J. Stanley Matson, passed away recently. If you follow us on social media or receive our emails, you may have seen some of the tributes we've posted. I recommend reading them as it will give you a deep sense of Stan the man, but also our history here at the C.S. Lewis Foundation. Stan founded the foundation in 1986, and in doing so deeply changed the trajectory of many lives. Personally, I don't remember actually ever meeting Stan. He was simply a constant in my life from about middle school and onwards due to my attending school with his daughter and to my mother's involvement with the C.S. Lewis Foundation. He was one of the only people that I knew that still called me by my maiden name. Tonight, we'd like to share a poem written and read by Malcolm Geit in honor of Stan and recorded for his retirement party last year. Malcolm has been a friend of the C.S. Lewis Foundation since 2002 and will be the guest on our next webinar. So please enjoy Malcolm reading a poem he wrote for Stan. Well, greetings to you, Stan, and uh, uh, warm love and good wishes from Oxford. I only wish I were speaking to you um, 
fully and in person, but uh, I just want to thank you for the enormous good you've done in the world in bringing this foundation into being and sustaining it and opening up this extraordinary uh, intellectual and gracious hospitality to so many of us. So I've written a poem for you and uh, it's called Sometimes One Person. Sometimes one person changes things for good, takes the adventure, answers the true call, and bodies forth their faith in flesh and blood, not knowing if their work will stand or fall. Maybe the seed will grow, or maybe not. At least the seed is sown in faith and hope. <coughs> the Lord will give the growth as he sees fit. That's what you did for us. And now the cup, so empty when you held it first, is full, overflowing, blessing one and all. Now we enjoy what you made possible. Thanks so much, Stan. I hope that if that interested you, you'll go back and listen to some of the amazing speakers, some of the amazing things that Stan has made happen uh, in the last 30, 35 years. Tonight, we have a brand new guest, Dr. Mark Knoll. Uh, we have wanted to have Dr. Knoll for a long time and have followed his career with interest. Dr. M Mark Knoll is the Francis A. McEnany Professor of History Emeritus at the University of Notre Dame. His books and most of his courses discuss subjects related to the history of Christianity in the United States, Canada, and the modern world, including the scandal of the evangelical mind and America's God, from Jonathan Edwards to Abraham Lincoln. He's the author of many books, a fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. He's received the National Humanities Medal and been the recipient of three fellowships from the National Endowment for the Humanities. This seems like very, a very short bio for Dr. Knoll, who is such an incredibly accomplished historian. So I'd like to welcome Dr. Knoll to the screen with me tonight. Hello, Dr. Knoll. Thank you for the very kind introduction. It's a real privilege to be with the C.S. Lewis Institute. Thank you. So the project uh, we're talking about tonight began in 2013 during my years teaching at Wheaton College. And while I never considered myself a C.S. Lewis expert, I had enjoyed numerous illuminating conversations with Chris Mitchell, the director of Wheaton's Wave Center, which, as many of you know, curates works by and about Lewis and six other British Christian authors significant in his life. In those conversations, I had sometimes expressed the opinion that while direct attention to Lewis was a good thing, that attention could become too tightly focused. My thought was that if Lewis was read and appreciated without more attention to the context in which he lived and worked, it risked adoration of Lewis, preventing the possibility of insight or understanding drawn from connections in his own time. So for a conference in late 2013 to commemorate the 50th anniversary of Lewis's death, Chris asked me to contribute a paper featuring attention to those connections. I can't remember exactly the thought process that led to my paper, except that it seemed like an appropriate task for myself as a historian, who had done a great deal of work on the Christian history of the United States, to ask what Lewis's early reception by American readers told us not only about Lewis, but about those who read Lewis and responded in print to what they had read. I also thought that for a conference paper, it would be enough to focus on the years before Lewis became hyper-famous with the publication of the first Narnia book in 1950 and then Mere Christianity in 1952. As it happened, when Chris's invitation arrived, I was teaching at the University of Notre Dame and privileged through Notre Dame's generosity to employ my wife Maggie, a trained librarian, as a part-time research assistant. Maggie was eager to help. She soon found from periodicals in Notre Dame's library and on the internet that there was indeed a great deal of early American commentary on Lewis. It began as a trickle in the 1930s and early 1940s, 
primarily in scholarly journals with references to the allegory of love and a preface to Paradise Lost, but also with some interest in Lewis's debate with E.M. W. Tilliard in The Personal Heresy. But then, with the American publication of the Screwtape Letters in February 1943, a year after its appearance in Britain, attention to Lewis exploded. From that point on, Lewis seemed to be everywhere, including newspapers, which then published many more serious book reviews than is the case today, middle-brow periodicals, and scholarly journals. The quantity of material was so great, it made sense to limit my coverage to responses published about the 17 Lewis books that were available to American readers before, between late 1935. The first review we found was in the New York Times, December 1935, on the Pilgrim's Regress, through 1947, and Lewis's appearance on the cover of Time magazine for its issue of September 8th. The conference paper was delivered and then with slight revisions published in 2021 as part of a collection edited by Bruce Johnson, The Undiscovered Lewis, which because of Chris Mitchell's untimely death in 2014, became a volume dedicated to his memory. Because of my wife's research, however, we had found much more interesting material than could fit into one conference paper. Thus it came about that when the current directors of the Wade Center, David and Crystal Downing, asked if I would become a Hanson lecturer, they were amenable to the idea of expanding what I had done earlier. The Hanson lectures are aimed at helping Wheaton students, Wheaton faculty, and wider audiences engage the resources of the Wade Center. The lectures were delivered in early 2022 and the book was published late last year. Between 2013 and when my book appeared, as many in this audience will know, three fine books were published on what might be called the C.S. Lewis phenomenon. K. Allen Snyder's American Discoverer C.S. Lewis, His Profound Impact in 2016. George Marsden's C.S. Lewis's Mere Christianity, A Biography, also in 2016. And Stephanie Derrick's The Fame of C.S. Lewis, A Controversialist Reception in Britain and America in 2018. These excellent studies include American responses for the period I studied, but without a primary concern for what those responses revealed about the different constituencies that read Lewis and about the general state of American culture when those responses appeared. For my purposes, I divided Lewis readers and reviewers into three groups, Roman Catholics, Protestants of all types, and then those who wrote for general media, both scholarly and popular. In some ways, the most surprising finding of our research was that Catholic readers provided the fullest, most learned, and most appreciative audience. Protestant reviewers, while mainly pos positive, engaged with fewer works. Evangelical Protestants, who are now, of course, among the most enthusiastic Lewis devotees, trailed Protestants of the main line in coming to appreciate Lewis. In American academic journals, Lewis's literary scholarship won a respectful, though modest, hearing. By contrast, after the screw tape letters appeared, newspapers and periodicals like the Saturday Review and Time provided full-scale treatment, which was usually positive, but with some interesting criticism as well. Catholic attention to Lewis began with a 1939 review of the personal heresy by Thomas Merton shortly after he had sought Catholic baptism, and not long before, he joined the Trappist Abbey of Our Lady in Gethsemane, Kentucky. Merton commended Lewis for arguing that the enduring value of literary works lay in what they revealed about reality, rather than what they revealed about the author. Then, after Macmillan rushed a number of Lewis works into print, they received detailed attention from several Catholic periodicals and from several Catholics writing in the mainstream media. During the period I studied, Catholics referenced all 17 of Lewis books available to Americans, and they were the only group to do so. No other constituency treated both popular and scholarly works so thoroughly. Occasional criticism did surface, particularly that Lewis slighted the institution of the church in his presentation of Christian faith, a more serious reservation pertained not to Lewis himself, but was aimed by Catholic conservatives at their fellow Catholics who recommended Lewis so enthusiastically, but without heeding a canon of the church 
demanding that approval of non-Catholic authors secure official permission before that approval was expressed. I was particularly struck by the fact that the two longest, most learned, and most laudatory examples of Lewis criticism by any Americans in this period were authored by Catholic professors of English. One came from Victor Ham, who taught at Marquette, in a lengthy essay review of Paralandra, he began with these striking words. Milton wrote the epics of Paradise Lost and Paradise Regained. Mr. C.S. Lewis has essayed the epic of Paradise Retained. The essay went on to exp expound on how Lewis's mastery of Milton's epic brilliantly informed his work of science fiction. The most impressive Lewis criticism of this period came in a two-part series published in May and June, 1944, in America, a weekly thought journal sponsored by American Jesuits. The author was Charles Brady, who taught at Canisius College in Buffalo, New York. In these two articles, Brady explained how Lewis's academic writing on Shelley, Chaucer, and especially Milton informed his works for popular audiences like the Screw Tape Letters, which Brady called the most phenomenally popular household book of applied religion in the 20th century. Brady urged his readers, however, to go beyond this one work to other writings since Lewis was, in his words, the only truly popular champion of orthodoxy in book, pamphlet, and radio address since the passing of Gilbert Keith Chesterton. In praising the unobtrusive learning behind such work, Brady claimed that the pages of Lewis's writing constituted a melodious sounding board, a whispering gallery of what, it is great, of what is great in world literature. And then Brady specified as Lewis's sources, Virgil and the Aeneid, R.H. Benson, Olaf Stapleton, Ryder Haggard, Ronald Knox, J.R.R. Tolkien, William Morris, Jonathan Swift, John Henry Newman, Chaucer, Dante, and many others, including especially, again, Milton. Specifically, Catholic concerns surfaced only once when Brady charted other reviewers for treating Out of the Silent Planet and Paralandra very shabbily, including some feckless Catholic reviewers who had missed the subtle defense of Christian orthodoxy in these works. For the rest, this first American to write comprehensively about C.S. Lewis's books offered his glowing introduction in a Catholic magazine with the express hope that more Catholic readers would be drawn to those books. When Brady sent a copy of his articles to Lewis, he responded that Brady was the first of my critics so far who has really read and understood all of my books. In general, Catholics lauded Lewis's learning, but also the accessibility of his writing. They praised the clarity of his Christian communication. Theologically, they appreciated that Lewis's apologetic began with an appeal to universal human instincts about objective morality, which several critics likened to Catholic teaching about natural theology, extending back to Thomas Aquinas. No Protestant critic would come anywhere close to what Catholics wrote about Lewis until Chad Walsh at Deloitte College began to publish later in the decade. Walsh, the most perceptive Protestant who wrote about Lewis in this period, published substantial reviews in both Protestant and general periodicals, including a major article from 1946 in The Atlantic entitled C.S. Lewis, Apostle to the Skeptics. A wide range of Methodist, Lutheran, Baptist, and Episcopal periodicals also routinely reviewed Lewis positively, though none with the depth found among the Catholics. One of the most interesting articles in a Protestant publication appeared in the Christian Century. In 1946, it ran an essay by an Episcopal priest who had visited Lewis in Oxford and reported patronizingly, that Lewis did not seem much interested in Søren Kierkegaard or contemporary existentialism. The most important contribution of this article, however, concerned W. H. Auden, who happened to be a parishioner of the author's church. 
When Lewis heard that Auden had enthusiastically introduced his rector to the screw tape letters, Lewis said he had noticed that the poet's recent works reflect a strong interest in religion, especially from the viewpoint of Orthodox Christian theology. Earlier, Auden had written a strongly positive review of the great divorce. Evangelical Protestant responses to Lewis appeared late and with considerable hesitation. The widely circulated Sunday School Times mentioned a couple of Lewis's fantasies. The most space given over to Lewis in that widely read periodical came in the form of advertisements placed by Macmillan rather than anything written about Lewis himself. A short review in Moody Monthly of the first pamphlet from Lewis's broadcast talks, The Case for Christianity, was typical. It praised the work's sprightly style and what Lewis wrote about instincts concerning right and wrong. Yet two thirds of this short notice questioned whether Lewis's apologetical efforts could be successful and worried that he had not said the right things about sacraments and the atonement. The only evangelical Protestants to write at any length or depth about Lewis were conservative Presbyterians associated with Westminster Seminary in Philadelphia. While several of these Presbyterians expressed real delight at Lewis's literary verve and also his promotion of mere Christianity, they objected to what he had said or what he said about universal human instincts providing a launching place for Christian apologetics. They objected, in other words, to the statements about natural law that Catholic critics had found so compelling. The reception of Lewis in newspapers, general circulation periodicals, and academic journals was again mostly positive. The one thoroughly negative review was published in the New Republic in 1944. Its author was Alistair Cook who would later become well known as the host of public television's Masterpiece Theater. To Cook, Lewis was a quack who exploited doubting times to become a minor prophet, pressed into making a career of reassurance. Much more common in the general press was appreciation, occasionally with reservations, more often with appreciation alongside mild criticisms, but most often with simple enthusiasm. The American years 1935 through 1947 were dominated by pervasive national crises. First the depression, then World War II, and then uncertainties after the war about charting a course as the world's dominant superpower. In that period and with those tensions, Lewis's literary scholarship, his creative works, the broadcast talks that would later be gathered together as mere Christianity, and overtly theological works like The Problem of Pain and Miracles resonated powerfully with Americans of all sorts. These same years were also witnessing a crucial cultural transition from a past in which Christian values could be more or less taken for granted by wide swaths of the American people to a future in which those values became increasingly contested. In that context, Lewis's defense of the instinctive human belief in moral absolutes and his advocacy for specifically Christian truths reached an appreciative audience well beyond the Christian circles where he remains so well regarded today. That he became so popular and with almost no overt political references reveals something important about the period 1935 to 1947 and also about how our present circumstances have changed from that earlier period. Thank you. All right. Thank you so much, Professor Noel, for giving us the overview of, of the book and some tantalizing questions and some surprising findings. I, I myself, too, reading it was shocked to learn about the uh, immediate Catholic exuberance for Lewis and also the slow evangelical uptake, because it's just not what you expect when you know Lewis you think about his evangelical American fans like those those that's probably his biggest support demographic and um to have to know that that, that was kind of took a while for that to to um develop was interesting um for those of you that would like to ask questions 
uh, please put them in the Q&A and I will look through them. I, I'd like to start off with one that I wanted to ask about, and you touch on it in the conclusion of the book. Um, this shows, this research shows a lot of interesting stuff about what American religious life was like at the time that Lewis was publishing in his early career. Um, but we're coming up now, and especially with, say, Pilgrim's Regress or something, 90, almost 90 years, so that, you know, these, these books will soon be 100 years old, and they're still popular. But what does it tell us, what does your research tell us, and what does Lewis's popularity tell us about now? Like, what, what, can we, what can we do to apply it to the present? Yes, uh, clearly in the period I was working on, there was a kind of residual Christianity, not sharply focused Christian belief, but residual Christianity. So apart with just very occasional examples like, like Alistair Cook, um, the Christianity in Lewis's work was not an objection, particularly for those who recognized its creativity, its, its intellectual depth, and his, his uh, literary learning. Today, we simply don't have that kind of residual awareness, commitment to what might be called traditional Western values. It may, actually, in my view, I think we, we, we actually have improved in, in some ways. Uh, during uh, World War II, uh, it, it took a, a real uh, a strenuous activity to, to make uh, the plight of African Americans in, in uh, the United States visible. But also, uh, we, we have a much more fragmented uh, situation now. So I came to the conclusion in, in trying to figure out a way to bring this uh, study to a close, that the combination that Lewis offered probably is the only way forward, regardless of what comes of it. And that combination was real depth in what he knew about, so he was a first order literary scholar, creativity of expression, as exhibited by the, the, the Ransom Trilogy, uh, good writing, positive focus on mere Christianity rather than anything that denominational, and then a willingness to engage in, in uh, the public square. In his day, that combination harvested a tremendous profit. In our day, whether it will or not, is probably not for us to say, but that combination of quality seems, strikes me as the only way, possible way forward for doing anything with integrity in the public sphere. I liked how you talked also about, you know, there's sometimes there's a little bit of a temptation to maybe try to imitate Lewis, and that's not that's not the way right way to go. Although we can try to be inspired by, say, his characteristics and and the strengths that he had, and especially his savvy, I think was one of the the things that you said. I, well, Im imitating Lewis is certainly a temptation when when you read him and you're just blown away by how interesting he is, but then uh, that becomes a a mistake by not realizing that Lewis was writing in his times. And while many things would remain the same in our times, there are some things that are considerably different. And um, effective Christian proclamation, mm -hmm. I think, needs to take into account those differences. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. Um, we've got a number of great questions that are coming in, so I'll go ahead and, and start reading those. Uh, Harvey Solganic, I hope, sorry if I pronounced that incorrectly, um, says, thank you for your research on, on Lewis works by Christians. As a Messianic Jewish Christian, I, was, I have been influenced by Lewis. Did you find any Jewish writers writing about Lewis? Uh, I am currently looking at researching this topic. I did not. Um, although I did not track down the background of every one of the uh, reviewers, particularly in newspapers, of which there were dozens, scores, uh, and, and almost all of them enthusiastic. Actually, it would be interesting I deposited at the Wade Center the, the very extensive book my wife worked up explaining as much as could be, she could find out about all of the authors. I don't mm -hmm. think there were identifiably Jewish authors in this period. It'd be great if someone could find some. Yeah, that would be fascinating. I, I hope to see I hope to see some some fruit coming from the research that was mentioned there. Um, Margaret Horowitz or Horowitz <clears throat> uh, says, "Thank you for your excellent talk. Um, you talked." Uh, about Charles Brady in particular, and you included the essays at the end. So I did want to mention that those were like uh, searingly uh, powerful <laughs> essays. There, I, I don't remember really reading uh, like literary criticism that was that uh, potent. I feel like, um, 
And so uh, I recommend it to all of you that are watching to, to go to go look them up. Um, but uh, Margaret asks, uh, did Lewis and Charles Brady correspond uh, more about it? Yes, uh, the, the, um, the, the current editors of America magazine did give us the permission to reprint the, the two essays uh, from 1944. And they, they, as, as Chris suggested, they really do sparkle. Uh, uh, Brady was a learned person. He knew the classics. He knew medieval literature. He knew Renaissance literature. He knew... Catholic, in fact, he, he edited a book not so long thereafter of Catholic literary works trying to show that Catholics could be lively minds. He did send his essays to Lewis, and as I mentioned, Lewis wrote back and said, you're the first person to get me entire. And then Brady went on to write several reviews of Lewis's later works, um, right up into the 50, early 50s, Narnia Tales. He reviewed also uh, Charles Williams, J.R. Tolkien, and at some stage we found out from Kines Kinesius College archivist, he had worked on a manuscript on Lewis, Tolkien, and Sayers. But for one reason or another, he was getting into writing his own fiction. He did fictionized studies of uh, Leif Erikson, Thomas More. He also did a book for children, um, imagining a mouse in the church where Silent Night was first uh, performed. So he got busy on other things and never published that manuscript. But it would have been fascinating because he was he was a, a reader of Lewis and his friends for at least another 15 years after the 1944 essays. Um, what, what about Brady's assessment do you think made Lewis make that comment? That Because that's really a tantalizing comment about like that Brady understood him better than anyone else that is that's high praise right I mean that's what you want to hear from an author I, I I'm curious about especially in like say Pilgrim's Regress for instance um, right. there's a we could talk about um why 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 do, you, why do you think that was he was so keyed in well it what uh, blew me away when in reading Brady and then reading other people writing on, including the really fine essays by Chad Walsh that some of you know led to a book, I think, from 1949 50, the same title, C.S. Lewis, Apostle of the Skeptic. Nobody else showed how thoroughly the work in The Allegory of Love and A Preface to Paradise Lost informed Screw Tape, The Great Divorce, The Ransom Trilogy. And then how uh, much um, the standpoint in the debate with Tillyard resonated with what Lewis had to say in the uh, the, the Men Without Chess book uh, immediately uh, toward the end of the war. And I think what what Lewis was struck in Brady by is, is how he, he was able to talk about Lewis, the academic scholar, and Lewis, the Christian apologist, and Lewis, the Christian fantasist, and to do so coherently. Nobody else did that in this period. And, I, and I, I'll, I'll give away to Lewis scholars and know who, who did it. I'm sure people have done it later, but this, this was extraordinary. Hmm. I, and that's, that's still something, I mean, I even noticed this in myself. I'm like, I, I have read his popular, most famous books, and some of them several times, but I, I actually am not as familiar with the, the academic works you know we, we actually read a preface paradise lost when i was an undergrad but mm -hmm. um, some of some of his more uh lesser known ones that were earlier in his career it does seem like there's a lot more crossover <laughs> than, than we thought um some other great questions coming in uh barbara perry wants to know um what do you think about the difference in responsivity to lewis in the u.s versus the uk especially especially today with the uk being right. not as enthusiastic as, as we are well, the Stephanie Derrick book that I mentioned is really, really, really good on that. And she um, has a, a, a solid explanation for why Lewis, probably from the late 40s, uh, has always been more popular in the U.S. than in the U.K. She has some excellent research on the, the resentment of Lewis's academics at his popularity, partly that, the resentment at how... how how much he uh, skewered some of their um, uh, pet pet theories about life in general. Um, and I think that, that she also draws attention to the, to the uh, over the Atlantic phenomenon that uh, Lewis's 
crisp, sharp prose devoted to serious theological topics, his creative and intelligence, hit, hit the fact that he came from uh, Ireland, UK. Th these, these were uh, factors that put Lewis outside of the ordinary voices in America in a way that they never were outside. Or, and they were, there, there was of course Chesterton and there, there, was, there was Dorothy Sayer, Dorothy L. Sayers and there were others in the UK, not the same as Lewis, but, but doing something similar Whereas it just wasn't the case in the U.S., and then I, I think it, it's it's also worth thinking about that that um, Lewis's popularity in the U.S. had has to do with the fragmented ecclesiastical Christian situation in in the, in the United States, and whether he was thinking about this when he worked on mere Christianity, it really was a stroke of genius for better even for the U.S., it's fragmented religious Christian landscape where having a banner that was clearly orthodox, clearly tradition, but not denominational was a, was a really unusual thing. I've been interested to people talking to friends in Australia and Canada, South Africa about Lewis's reputation. He does have a good reputation in all these places. I don't have the sense that any of them, that in any of them it's been as strong as in the U.S., but again, the, the, I, I would refer people to, to the book uh, by Stephanie Derrick, which is, is, is really informative on these questions. Well, that reference to like how mere Christianity may be found fertile ground here because of the diffusion of denominations and so on, that, that actually maybe leads to a, a good segue to the next question by Harley Baker. Um, could you say more about what you mean by residual Christianity and perhaps how much of that there remains today. Is that the same thing as the mere Christianity? This is my sort of question too. Is the mere uh, Christianity no. or is it slightly uh, different? No. By residual Christianity, I mean uh, um, an awareness in the culture of the significance of the Christian formation of the West, even by people who aren't particularly keen on being Christian themselves. It was intriguing to look at the, the early scholarly response to Lewis uh, by people like Arthur O. Lovejoy, the great chain of being, author, founder of the Journal of Intellectual History. In his inaugural article and in the inaugural issue, Lovejoy points to C.S. Lewis as someone who understands some of the really important past handed on uh, to the present. Uh, Roland Bainton, the uh, renowned biographer of Martin Luther referred positively to Lewis in a, a review on uh, a medieval developments co coming into the er early modern period. Uh, a number of the uh, writers of reviews in newspapers, and some of them are actually fairly sophisticated. They weren't just, uh, I mean, there were people with, with some kind of knowledge themselves, uh, expressed uh, delight that there was a presentation of classical Christianity much more appealing than they were hearing regularly from, from uh, the churches. So yes, a residual Christianity, I, I do mean in the culture, mere Christianity, I think had the greatest appeal to Christian believers. It was, it was one of the things that uh, several of the Catholic commentators half praised and half criticized. They praised it because it was obvious, at least, at least from my point of view, it was obvious that they were kind of straining toward the Vatican II moment when they could break mm. through the Catholic Protestant barriers and actually have some positive communication. But then they were nervous because they knew that Catholic theology really re required a central central place uh, for, the ch for the church. Eventually, it was uh, the mere Christianity that I think won over the evangelical and post-fundamentalist. One of the really fun things that uh, happened in the research was uh, an archivist at Wheaton found a letter, a couple of letters that Elizabeth Howard had written to her parents, the, the proprietors of the Sunday School Times, when she was an undergraduate at Wheaton, 1943, 1944, saying, I'm reading this book called The Screwtape Letters. You need to get the whole of this. It's a wonderful picture of Christian faith. So here is someone from a sort of a more or less fundamentalist household telling her parents that this British author, not emphasizing fundamentalist particulars, really had something interesting to say. 
But I think that the mere Christianity was, was something that more brought together um, diverse believers. The residual Christianity was what was in the culture and that would last, I think, uh, into the 1950s probably, but then dissipate thereafter. Uh, that actually will... Speaking of the fundamentalists, uh, Sally King asked a question ju uh, just about that, actually, um, about the relation of Lewis to evangelical fundamentalism and its evolution, to maybe use an obvious <laughs> um, at this time period. Uh, and so the view of early evangelical fundamentalists, she, she wants to know if they were anti-Lewis or positive, um, given that his books were probably not reflective of conservative evangelical theology, right. fundamentalist theology. Um, it sounds like from what you said, you know, it, it, not so much at first, but do do fundamentalists ever really warm to Lewis? Is there, or is this mostly just the the people that become neo evangelicals? Uh, that's, a, like that, that's a better question than I can answer. I'm, I'm, afraid. <laughs> I'm sure many of you heard the the story that I think I think George Marsden told me this is actually if it isn't true, it's pretty close to true that when Bob Jones visited uh, mm -hmm. Lewis in the early '50s, he came back to the United States and said, well, "That man smokes. That man drinks." But I do believe he is a Christian. <laughs> so, <laughs> uh, actually, uh, like the like the question about Jewish uh, or uh, uh, Messianic Jewish readers of Lewis, it'd be really interesting to, for someone to do a study of of fundamentalist periodicals right right to the present and see where Lewis appears. I think what what if you just keep chronology in mind, the the, the early nineteen forties, post World War is, is post World War Two is when Significant leaders like Carl Henry, E.J. Carnell are, are trying to preserve what they consider the Christian Orthodox positions handed on from fundamentalism, but also trying to break away from the cultural narrow-mindedness and the focus on secondary matters. Carl Henry uh, was responsible in the, the, the regular publication of the National Association of Evangelicals for the, the, the literature review. And... Uh, that was what, what showed up on Lewis there was like in Moody Monthly. Uh, I think uh, I got it in the book, but the category was non-evangelical but useful writing. <laughs> Lewis's book, book sh sh showed up there. By the late 1940s, people like Chad Walsh were communicating with uh, folks at, at, for example, Wheaton College, uh, Clyde Kilby, the English professor who eventually gathered the papers and became the Wade Center came on to Lewis in the late 40s, and, and it was obviously somebody he, he was looking for, a, a bright, informed, literary, sophisticated, but also ably communicating voice, promoting not the particulars of one style of Christian faith, but mere Christianity. So yes, uh, those who wanted to continue to call themselves fundamentals, I'm not sure. But for people who were conscious of needing to do more culturally, do more with literature, do more with the arts, more with culture. Lewis was just a godsend. Yeah, I would be fascinated to look into that more of like if if the ones that stayed, you know, following Marsden's study of fundamentalism, if the ones that stayed in the enclaves just didn't. Because I, 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 mean, I think the story about Bob Jones Jr., it is believable to me that Lewis would take him to a pub without really realizing that he wouldn't drink. It maybe is not so believable to me that Bob Jones Jr. would say such positive things about him when he was so severe about Billy Graham being like this instrument of of the anti-racist. It's like, you know, Graham's theology was a lot more mainstream than, than a lot of Lewis's. So I, I don't know. I don't know if he would be as so charitable. Maybe I, I don't. I don't know. It's 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 plausible, like you said, but maybe maybe slightly uh, embellished. Um, but I, I do. I do wonder if the the neo evangelical trend can be seen in just Lewis's career of making it more apparent. Like like they Carl Henry asked him to write for the first issue of Christianity Today, and he he turned them down. But the fact that he was the one that they wanted, I think, says a lot. Well, uh, I, I should have mentioned this earlier, but a, a really important influence in bringing Lewis to the broader evangelical world was InterVarsity Christian Fellowship. His magazine in 1944, 1945, reprinted a section from one of the pamphlets coming from a broadcast talk. There was quite a, uh, at least one or two, two or three, just exploratory. Here, here's this Oxford uh, 
Don, who is uh, presenting lively accounts of Christian faith. And it was, it was clear you had a different uh, different mindset by the leaders of InterVarsity. And significantly, the editor of his magazine, when um, it was it, 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 it reproduced some of Lewis's own writing and then reported positively on Lewis, was Kenneth Taylor, who at the time, I believe, was employed by Moody Press, but was on in the process of working on the living letters and then the living New Testament. And so in that way, indicating another way of trying to not debunk the King James Version, but to push toward a more contemporary, more modern, more effective way of communicating Christian truth. So InterVarsity Press, was, uh, InterVarsity Christian Fellowship and, and, and uh, re related agents are really important in this uh, burgeoning of evangelical interest in Lewis. This actually, uh, Amber Saladin, our arts and ministry director, she she wanted to ask a question related to this about, you know, if he's sort of, if, if Lewis maybe can be seen in some ways as kind of a bridge or InterVarsity maybe supports his work uh, or or uses him as kind of a bridge between fundamentalism and evangelicalism. Is there a similar figure or organization today that you see doing the same kind of thing? I kind of wondered about like BioLogos and, and Francis Collins as maybe being. Right. Yes. Kind of... Yes. That's, that's a, yes. Um, the, the Christian and the arts group and their magazine, what's it called? Images. Um, mm -hmm. It would certainly be that way. I, I actually think there probably are many more Christian groups doing that today. The, the, the question is in our fragmented media environment, whether any single effort or multiple efforts uh, can have the same kind of impact as Lewis did have in an, in an era when uh, not only the Catholic periodicals, eventually the uh, evangelical and fundamentalist periodicals, the mainstream Protestant periodicals, the book review sections of the New York Times, the New York Herald Tribune, dozens of newspapers were all writing about this one individual from, from one angle or another. It just, I think in our fragmented mm -hmm. landscape of communications, we're, ne we're not going to see anything like that, but I, I do, I agree with you. I think there are many, many, I'd say, cr Christian of, of di really different sort, Catholic, Orthodox, wide variety of Protestants that are doing Lewis-type work, but with a very different situation than he, than he encountered. Hmm. Um, we have a question that's been here for a while that I wanted to, I wanted to circle back to, and I think it, it can kind of tie into what we've been talking. Uh, Mildred, and I'm sorry if I mispronounced this, Shibkowski, I think, um, uh, asked, uh, uh, noted about how Lewis being in Times Mag Time Magazine was a big deal in 1947, I think, right? Um, and so you talked a little bit about the reactions from the non-Christian world to that and to him, and which is interesting to hear about. And I also kind of want to add on to that, like, about continued Lewis, uh, maybe non-Christian interest in Lewis today compared to, to then. Because I noticed, like, but my my students all know him because of Narnia, um, yeah. and and they are still very familiar with him, mostly because of the movie. But a lot of them had the books read to them, so there is still a lot of knowledge of him. But uh, the the contrast and what you saw would be interesting to to hear. Yes, and and certainly one of the one of the interesting things to me was how how widely, at least some of Lewis's works, either, mostly I think the uh, like the Great Divorce and the the, the Ransom trilogy were treated seriously. Uh, the, the Lewis appeared on the cover of the Saturday Review of Literature in 1943 or four, so several years before he was on the cover of, of uh, Time. And the, the editor, Leonard Bacon, who was a distinguished uh, Pulitzer Prize winning poet, ha had a rapturous article on Lewis uh, for recognizing the Christianity behind what he wrote, but rapturous about the form, formal uh, expertise uh, of, of his works. Now, today, I, I just, well, I think uh, a, a comparison would be Marilyn Robinson, mm -hmm. when she wrote about uh, John Ames, garnered a lot of favorable attention, even though, I would say, even though people knew <laughs> that Ames was a real serious Bartian Protestant. <laughs> uh, 
Uh, it's hard for me to th think of th think of uh, others. Um, um, yeah, I think you have to get get at somebody like Alan Jacobs, who who follows things really closely in the present, to uh, to to give you others. Well, I think uh, the fact that the fact that Robinson writes so much fiction and nonfiction from yes. an obviously Christian yeah. standpoint. Yeah. Right. Uh, yes, I think she there would be some some comparable uh, impact, but uh, again. Uh, Appealing to a different sort of audience and, and appealing in, in a different sort of way. Um, one last question before we do the advertisement for our commercial for some of our upcoming stuff. Um, I wanted to ask Max Feiler has an interesting one about media, which I think would be a fascinating component of this we haven't talked about. Uh, you know, in England, Lewis was famous for the radio broadcasts in a lot of ways. But uh, would, would he have been so popular here in the US on radio as he was in England? Or is, or is, is there something about the print media that best brought him out in the US? That's actually a really interesting question. I, I, I'm not sure I can answer it, but I can, I can say I think a couple of interesting things. Um, I found it ironic that the, the one really thorough knockdown of Lewis came from Alistair Cook, who shortly thereafter began his weekly radio broadcast back to England, Letter from America, that went on for, I don't know, 40 or 50 years. So he was a superb radio communicator but in brief and oftentimes telegraphed. And he was in a sense knocking Lewis for being a superb radio communicator, telegraphing things uh, succinctly. The other thing I would say is that um, the Hanson lecture is set up so that there's a commentary by Wheaton faculty of the different lectures. And the commentator from, from my lecture on the mainstream media was Kirk Farney, Wheaton's um, Vice President for Advancement, but also PhD in, in uh, uh, history from, from Notre Dame. He wrote his dissertation and a fine book now from University Press on uh, Monsignor Sheen, Bishop Fulton Sheen, mm -hmm. and Walter Meyer of the Lutheran Hour, who in the 1930s may have been the most popular people on American radio. Uh, in the late 1930s, the, the, the broadcaster that won the rights for the World Series got it out to like 90 stations. Walter Meyer was on like 400 stations at the same time. So they were they were more preacher preaching. Lewis was less of a preacher and more of a what a lay communicator. Mm -hmm. And uh, in on the BBC, you never had commercials which I think actually would have been significant. Of course, you didn't have commercials with Sheen or Meyer. Sheen was on the uh, Catholic Hour, the time donated to the to the churches. Uh, Meyer was, had to buy, the, the Missouri Synod Lutherans had to buy time, though they would not have been advertisements. But I do think the commercialization of, of radio makes a difference. So there was, Lewis never had to say, well, I'll be back after this word from. <laughs> um, um, well, a really good question. Yeah, it's an interesting part of the story of I think the evangelical eventual warming to him too, because uh, in terms of of media and presentation, because they have always been a, a, a group, a religious group that has been adept at using technology to evangelize, right? And I actually, I think one of the reasons, from my perspective, I think one of the reasons Lewis became so popular with the evangelicals is he had a new technology for evangelization, and it was novel writing, that this was, especially children's books, that this this was maybe something that, uh, you know, fundamentalists often were sort of standoffish about, but Lewis showed that it could really be uh, one of the maybe most effective ways uh, to, to spread the gospel, and so... Um, if, if anyone does that, then they're going to be welcomed. You know? uh, so real quick, we'll transition to our announcements uh, from President Elmore and have him come on for a second. Hi, Mark. Hi, Chris. Mark, it's wonderful to, to see you. And thank you for joining us tonight for this. Very informative and especially uh, just the long history of Lewis in America and all the uh, all the wrinkles in that and getting to the point where where we are today. So thank you for that. So I have a couple announcements to make uh, about upcoming events. But first, I'd like to thank our sponsors and our volunteers for making this happen tonight. 
Because of your generosity, we shine a spotlight on speakers who are living the legacy of C.S. Lewis in higher education, ministry, and the arts. Our goal is to equip, educate, and encourage Christians to be salt and light to the culture around them. Hopefully, rather than uh, saltiness and lightning, as sometimes happens. If you'd like to support these webinars or the work of the Foundation, please consider joining us by making a gift today through our website, www.cslewis.org. So we have several exciting events coming up this year next. Our first event uh, is our next webinar, which is January 10th. Uh, it's Saturday morning, uh, 10 a.m. Pacific, and I'm in Pacific time. So we'll, we'll do the math for you when we send out the announcement for whatever your time zone may be. And that'll be with poet Malcolm Guy. And we're very excited to see him again. You saw him on the video uh, sharing a tribute for Stan earlier. And we'd love to see you for the full webinar. He's going to be talking on the subject of Lent. After that, uh, our next in-person event is the C.S. Lewis Writers Conference, which will be May 2024. Thank you, Joshua, for putting that up on the screen. And we've partnered with Cultivating Oaks Press. Uh, some of you may personally know Lancia Smith and her organization, uh, but we're hosting, co-hosting the event in Colorado Springs at the Glen Airy Castle. Uh, it's actually a castle of sorts. Uh, at um, it's a navigator on property too, which is nice. Uh, but our theme is cultivating a writer's life. Speakers include Sally Clarkson, Jonathan Rogers, Lancia Smith, and Steve Lobby. We will be opening registration next week. And we're excited to say that we've launched the website with all the information uh, as of this morning. So go look at that and praise to uh, Joshua George who helped us design and create that website. I'm also excited to announce uh, this summer's summer seminars at the Kilns in Oxford, England are now open for registration. Uh, the program is one week in Oxford with C.S. Lewis scholar Jerry Root, uh, who's always a favorite of ours. And it's part seminar at Lewis's home, which we own and operate, and part tour of Lewis related sites in the Oxford area. Spaces are limited only to 14 people per week small group. It's however many we could fit on the two uh, vans that we were able to rent and uh, register soon uh, for that because we did sell out in the first month last year. So go ahead, look at that, get those tickets as soon as you can. And I'd, I'll be there and I'd love to see you this summer in Oxford at the Kilns. Uh, if you receive our email newsletter, you'll get notifications for all of these things. Um, after having signed up for the webinar, we'll send you notifications as well. Um, but I did want to give you a head start on those registrations. So this is the first time we're announcing uh, outwardly that all these things are up and in place. If you have any questions about any of the events or anything coming up at the foundation or what our work is, please stick around for the discussion groups afterwards and join those. And I'll be happy to answer any questions you may have. So back to you, Chris and Mark. All right. Thank you, Steve. And so we have time to do, there's one last question, and I think we could, I would like to maybe add an addendum to it to kind of make it your final takeaway too, and then we will conclude. So Chad Nye asks, um, what do you think is the most significant impact or contribution of Lewis in the U.S. today? And I think that's a good one to end on and maybe a good one for you to also kind of add in your, your uh, final thoughts for us. I think the integrity with which Lewis went about his work is maybe the thing that can be most imitated. I actually closed the book uh, before we got to the appendix with the Charles Brady essays, where Lewis uh, did an early draft of what the poem that became the Apolog Apologist's Prayer, in which he um, talked about the danger to the Christian writer who felt that he had been a success and the danger that came from the lack of humility and the lack of an understanding that anything that any believer does in, in public life can be done only by grace. So the, the integrity of his work, the humility of his attitude toward his own work, these, I think, are traits that can be imitated, not just in literary life, not just in apologetics, but in every aspect of Christian living. Well, thank you so much, 
for joining us and for talking about your book and all your research. Uh, it's very fascinating. As an American religious historian myself who works for the C.S. Lewis Foundation, this is 100% the thing that I'm interested in. And so very fascinating. Um, uh, th thank you so much. Um, we hope you enjoyed it too. And uh, we'll go ahead and let you go. I will be concluding here with a, uh, a short prayer. This was uh, this is in, uh, in memory of Stan Matson. Uh, this was actually selected by our uh, Amber Salad and our Arts and Ministry Director, and I'll go ahead and read it. Uh, this is an Eastern Orthodox prayer for the repose of um, souls who have passed on. O God of spirits and of all flesh, who has trampled down death and overthrown the devil and given life to thy world, do thou the same Lord give rest to the souls of thy departed servants in a place of brightness, a place of refreshment, a place of repose, where all sickness, sighing, and sorrow have fled away. Pardon every transgression which they have committed, whether by word or deed or thought, for thou art a good God and lovest mankind. Because there is no man who lives yet does not sin, for thou only art without sin. Thy righteousness is to all eternity, and thy word is truth. For thou art the resurrection, the life, and the repose of thy servants who have fallen asleep, O Christ our God. And unto thee we ascribe glory together with thy Father, who is from everlasting, and thine all-holy good and life-creating spirit, now and ever, and to the ages of ages. Amen. Amen.